I have my wife with me this time as the, as the resident uh, camera lady. I'm not good at that. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about marriage and, uh, and how to avoid conflict, how to avoid getting divorced. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but in, uh, in South Africa the divorce rate is sitting at about 40%. All of us think we're not going to get divorced, and yet somehow 40% of us manage to. If there was a figure about jumping out of an aeroplane with your parachute, I think maybe you would uh, think twice, and yet we all quite happily want to get married. Uh, this, uh, this afternoon I'm going to look firstly at men and women and how we are very different. My talk comes from, um, the, the information for this comes from the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. If you haven't read it, I would suggest you get it. It's a very interesting reading. It's not a Christian book, but just a book about men and women. They talk about uh, a husband and wife being Mr. Fix-It and the Home Improvement Committee. And guys, that's how it is. Let's, let's first look at uh, Mrs. Home Improvement Committee. I'd like to introduce you to her. Mrs. Home Improvement Committee is a communicator. She talks earlier than men, she talks better than men, and she talks more than men. Um, I never really understood how important communication is for a lady until I heard a talk once and, and, and a woman described it like this. If you were in the middle of a conversation with your wife and halfway through you just got up and you left, it is the same as if somebody orders you this big juicy steak at Spur and you're busy eating it and you're halfway through eating it and halfway through eating it somebody comes along and takes your steak away. That study for me the penny dropped. Do women actually see a conversation as eating juicy steak? Well, they do. Ladies and gentlemen, women enjoy communicating and talking, and it's important to them. Um, I learned something while doing a course about raising children that uh, I found important in my life. When you come home from work, I realize that maybe you both of you might be working before you have kids, when you come home from work, I would recommend you have a couch time. You sit and for 10 minutes, you talk with your spouse about your day. The kids will want your attention, they will come. You say, no, I must first talk to my partner for 10 minutes just to share about how my day went. Uh, that is a good foundation for getting your communication and your relationship working. Make it a rule for your marriage, uh, even before the, the kids come along. Uh, and when the kids do come along, the kids need to learn that they are number two after your spouse. So your spouse is more important than the children. And that is very important, especially for ladies. You, you need to show the children that your husband is more important. Now guys, you are Mr. Fix-It. But the problem with being a Mr. Fix-It is when your lady shares with her problems with you, your immediate reaction is you want to fix those problems. You want to give her a solution. But guys, that's not what she wants. What she wants is your sympathy and just to listen. And guys get very frustrated. You know, they'll, the lady will come in from work and she'll complain about something at work. And you'll say, well, you fix it like us, dum dum dum. Uh, and then the next day she comes and she complains exactly the same. And he said, but I told you yesterday how to fix it. She doesn't want you to fix her problems. She wants you to listen to her. To be sympathetic. Okay, guys, you got that one. Um, and something else now, which I'm talking to you ladies, you are on a home improvement committee. Uh, you like improving things, there's the joke about the, the, uh, the man who said he bought a, he bought a $30,000 cushion for his wife. And his mate said, how could a cushion cost $30,000? He said, well, well, we bought the cushion, that was only $10, but we got home, we put it on the couch. And the couch didn't look right, so we bought a new couch set. You know, that was $10,000. But when the, we bought the couch set home, the, the, then the TV line wasn't big enough, so we had to extend the wall. So the cushion eventually cost 30000 So ladies, they like to feather the nest and make it, and that's how God's made you. There's nothing wrong with that. But ladies, you have a tendency to want to improve your husbands too. And my advice to you is don't. 
You see, the problem is men see things as fixed or broken. You like to improve things. If you start trying to improve your husband, what you are telling him, what he is hearing, is that I am broken. And no man likes to be told that he is broken. You don't see it that way, but that's the way the communication is received. You understand? So ladies, don't try and change your husbands. You're not going to get it right. I told you last week, you know, when you get married, it's all. You walk down the aisle, you get to the altar, you sing a hymn. I'll alter him. No, you won't. Guys, don't change. Right. Let's look at Mr. Fix-It. This man that you married. What's he like? Well, Mr. Fix-It uh, has got a very fragile ego. The Bible says that, woman, you must respect your husbands. It's not for any other reason that, that that's what guys need. It's important to them. Um, and, and women need to remember this. Uh, let me give you some advice here. If you are going to criticize your husband, and, and, and it goes both ways actually, husbands and wives, there's something called a criticism sandwich. And you can use this in life. In fact, I'm an architecture lecturer, some of you, my students are here, and, and, and when architecture uh, students go for crits, it's a harrowing process, and I try and put in some good things. What a criticism sandwich it goes like this. First, you say something good. You compliment the person. Then you slip the criticism in in between, and then you compliment them again. You see how it works. So the person that you're criticizing actually has had two compliments for the criticism that you've given them. It's just sensitive and how you come about your criticism, and also time of day, you know, when he gets home from work, it's probably the worst time to give him a criticism. Wait until he's relaxed, he's, you know, had a beer or whatever, sitting by the TV and he's a bit more chill. Then you can talk to the guy. Right. Okay. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about, and I, uh, this is, you know, it's part of my whole thing, that guys are driven by sex. Ladies, if it wasn't for sex, most guys probably would never get married. I know you don't like me telling you that, but it's true. I'm just telling you the truth. And so it's important for them. And, 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 and intimacy uh, uh, and, and sex is important for a guy. Don't forget that. You know, a guy, you know, when you first get married, you obviously do it a whole lot more. But a guy needs it probably about twice a week. And, and that's important for him. Just remember that. The person who said, a way to a man's heart is through his stomach was 12 inches too high. Um, Ladies, and something I can tell you in the marriage scenario, you can barter with sex. I know you ladies don't think like that. For you, sex is, uh, is romance and it's mood and blah de blah de blah But guys are in the marketplace. They understand trading. They understand bartering. If you want uh, your husband to clean out the garage, and he said he'll do it, and he doesn't do it, and he said he'll do it, he doesn't do it, just sit him. Uh, Mr. Fix-It. We're not going to have sex again until the garage is tidied out. I'll give him three days. End of the third day, boy, he'll have that garage spick and span for you. <laughs> That's the way guys are. And they don't, you know, hold it against you. It's just the way our guys are. I'd like to draw you a little picture here. And it's about what I've just been speaking about, but it's quite graphic. There's Mr. Fix-It, and here's Mrs. Home Improvement Committee. There's their hearts, and there's something else. Now, I like flying. If I want to fly from here to Johannesburg, but there's a very strong wind coming down from Zimbabwe. I know that I need to deviate my flight path to allow for the wind to push me straight back on path. And it works exactly the same in relationships. The guy, here's Mr. Fix-It, that's where he wants to go. Okay? But if he goes directly there, he's not going to get anywhere. He needs to aim for that. If he aims for that, he will end up there. It's like a vector. And ladies, it's exactly the same. I know where you want to go, you want to go there. But the wind is blowing in the other direction. If you want to go directly there, you'll end up there somewhere. You need to aim for that to get that. It's a very graphic illustration, but it works, people. 
Must be. Right. I'd like to look at something else now. It's called the, your five love languages. And everybody has one and you will, you'll hear me talking about yourself in these. These five love languages are how people perceive love. If I was to say to you, Yagavaryu Manyoga Paruski, there's only one person in this room that will understand what I've said is my wife, because she's Russian and I've just spoken to you in Russian. She understands the language and I'm speaking the language. If you speak in a love language which your partner does not listen or understand, they will not perceive it to be love. So let me give them to you. The first one is physical touch. Some people receive love, uh, they feel loved if their partner hugs them, strokes them, you know, gives them a massage, and sex is part of that. The second one is words of affirmation, words of encouragement. You know, saying to somebody, oh, I appreciate you, you're a great guy, or you're looking beautiful today. Words, spoken words. Some people like that as their primary love language. The third one is gifts. If you give a gift to somebody, I know my daughter, I have two daughters. I used to do a lot of flying in my business. When I came off the airplanes, I would buy a little packet of sweets for each of my daughters. The one daughter was, wow, thanks dad, you're amazing. The other daughter was, oh, okay. One of them's primary love language is gifts, and it's still gifts. I know that if I buy her a present, she will really feel loved, because that's her love language, and the other one is, is different. The fourth one is uh, quality time, spending time with your partner. And when you spend time with somebody, you feel loved. And the last one is doing deeds. Now, for me, I cannot understand doing deeds is not one of my love languages. I don't understand it at all. Remember last week, if those of you here, I was talking about if you do the dishes, you get an 80% more chance of getting it that night and how that works. Well, it's because your spouse may well have a deeds as, as their love language. And they feel loved when you do the dishes. I know it doesn't, it doesn't seem logical to you, but that's not how it works. You need to learn what your partner's love language is, and you need to speak it. Mostly, the, 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 the touch and the words of affirmation are male ones, and mostly uh, quality time and, um, and deeds are female ones, but not exclusively so. They can be any. Uh, and I think, guys, if you find a girl whose who's primary love language is touch, Hey, cool. <laughs> and girls, equally, if you find a guy whose who's primary love language is, is the same as yours, which is, you know, it might be time or, or deeds, you've got a good thing going. But what you need to do in your relationship is discuss. You need to discuss how you're feeling. Um, and what you can also say, don't say to your partner, oh, I don't feel loved by you. What you can say is that you you shared about your love language. Did you say my love tank is empty? Please, I need you to, to, to work a bit on speaking my love language. I don't feel loved. I know you love me, but I don't feel loved. And, and, and communication, as we all know, is a key to, to a successful relationship. Right, okay. Let's, I want to share with you two scenarios which cause divorce. These scenarios come from Dr. James Dobson, if you know him. He's a counselor, a psychologist. He's dealt with thousands of cases of marital problems. And he says there are two main ones, and I'm going to give them to you. I've had friends get divorced, and guess what? They fit directly into these scenarios. So let's look at them, let's learn about them, and once you know them, you can avoid them in your life. The, the, the first one is when the, the woman divorces her husband. It's got to do with uh, money and going places in life. Um, Actually, let me just take a step back. These two scenarios relate very closely to the marriage vows. Remember the marriage vows? You guys all know them. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. You've all heard of them, right? I, I assume you've all heard of them. Well, what I need to tell you is that for richer, for poorer, 
Actually, only the girl needs to say that one, the lady. And in sickness and in health, that's the one the guy needs to say. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be important. You see, what happens is, she comes home from work, she's working hard, she's probably got kids as well. He's been unemployed for six months. And he's given up looking for work. He's sitting on the couch in his vest with a beer and he's watching sport. And she thinks in her head, he's going nowhere. And he's taking me with me taking me with him and I've seen that I had a, a couple of friends he got unemployed he was looking for work his work was bitty and she she need ladies need financial security they need that that uh, that buffer of finance to secure their families and look after themselves and if they don't have that it puts enormous stress on them and and, and the couple in question got divorced she divorced him because she could not she could not feel the financial security so guys um, financial security is a big thing for your for your, your wives. Be diligent with your money. You know, save. Have a bit of a nesting aside for rainy days. Uh, invest. Uh, work hard. Those sorts of things can help you be more attractive to your spouse. And now the other one. In sickness and in health. Guys, I said to you this in the last lecture, when you are sick, when, when your wife is sick, you're not going to get any. And when she's sick for a long time, you don't get any sex for a long time. And that can start affecting you. Um, I'm going to tell you the scenario that, Brit uh, that James Dobson uh, gave. And uh, I don't want to offend anyone here. I'm just telling you the truth. But it's, it might, this might hurt. Okay. What happens is the wife has a kid or two. She puts on weight. And, you know, she's not looking after her health. And what starts going through the husband's mind is, she's, you know, I'm embarrassed to be around her. We've got the, the office party on in two weeks time and, I, and I'm embarrassed to take her. It's not something he says, but it's something that's going through his mind. Now, if there are reasons why she is not um, giving him a lot of sex and she's not looking great, the temptation of the secretary at work who's, who's, who's uh, you know, flirting with him, it a, becomes a very big draw. And I, I had a couple that exact situation. He was a handsome guy, you know, he was sporty and he was, he was a handsome looking guy. His wife, she was, you know, a bit rough. And uh, yeah, I heard six months later, got divorced. He divorced her and he was running after a younger woman. So it's, it's not a nice thing to say, but it's, it's what happens out there in the world. And ladies, uh, your husband should love you no matter what you look like. Yes, we all know that. But I'm just saying, visual, visual and sex are important to a guy. Um, right, I want to talk a little bit about agape love. Remember uh, last week we talked about the different types of love? Agape love is a self-sacrificial type of love. And um, it's got nothing to do with fairness. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from English background. You know, we like cricket, we like fair play. And the English think they're the, world, the gift to the world because they bring fairness to the world. But you know, that, that love, the Christian love that is talked about, the grace, it's got nothing to do with fairness. It might come as a bit of a shock to you. But fairness and grace are different. Grace is when somebody does not get what they deserve. Fairness is what somebody gets what they deserve. Um, there was a story about a, a, a soldier who, who deserted in the army. It was the American Civil War. And they caught him. And they were going to shoot him for desertion. And uh, his mother wrote to the general and said, Mr. General, um, have grace towards my son, please. And the general wrote back, what has your son done to deserve grace? And she wrote back, he says, if, you say, if you're saying that, then you have no understanding of what grace is. Grace is giving without expecting anything in return. You see, some people think that when they get married, they're going to be happy. Their partner will provide their happiness. That is not the case. You need to be happy and content in who you are now. Because your partner is not going to give it to you. You may think that they do, but they don't. You need two people who are 100% 
in a marriage, not two people who are 50% and relying on the other person for their happiness. Um, divorce happens when one person becomes selfish. You see, what happens is the world out there, you know, the cosmopolitans of this world, they tell you that you need to be happy. You have a right to be happy. And when you suddenly become unhappy in a relationship, then you're thinking, there's something wrong. You know, I've married the wrong person. Uh, I, need to, I, need to, I need to get out. I need to find somebody else. And that's not the case. You need to sacrificially give. And if your both parties do that, then you have a relationship that works. And I'll tell you why this is the case. Um, I know some of you might have dishwashers. We, we most of the time wash the dishes ourselves. If, say on a six day week, uh, you wash the dishes three times and your partner washes the dishes three times, you come to either of them and you'll say, um, how many times have you washed the dishes this week? Oh, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure it's more than my wife. Oh, I don't know, but I'm sure it's more than my husband. When both sides have done equal, the perception is that you've done more. So you need to have that sacrificial thing in your mind because often it is actually a 50-50 relationship but if you perceive that you're giving more and you're happy with that then the, the relationship works. Um, there, 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 there is a concern here. The Bible talks about uh, being, being a servant to your partner, uh, being submissive to your partner. But where does that stop when one person becomes a doormat? It, it, it's, it's a sensitive, it's a difficult line. You should, you, the, the Bible says you should submit to each other. Yes, husbands submit to wives, wives submit to husbands. But what happens when one person becomes a doormat, when one person abuses that, that submission? How do you sort that out? How, how does that work? Because it's a reality, it's a, it's a real thing. You get, it doesn't only work with husbands uh, abusing their wives. Uh, you get men who are henpecked and their women abuse them. So this is a situation um, which actually the person who is being abused actually can do something about it. It's called defending your line of self-respect. I talked to you uh, last week about respect and we all need to respect ourselves in a relationship. Yes, be submissive. Yes, uh, serve your partner. But if your partner starts abusing you, you need to draw a line in the sand and say, there's a difference between me voluntarily serving you and submitting to you and you abusing me. This is the line of self-respect. Because my respect, you, you're demeaning my, you're not respecting me. So how does that work? Well guys, if any of you have tried to train a dog, I know this might sound a bit funny, a dog is trained by when it does something wrong, it, it's painful, and when it does something right, it gets rewarded. And you can train your partner. Believe it or not, you know, um, you can say to your partner, um, you know, you, you, you're treating me disrespectfully, I'm sorry, I'm going to withdraw from this relationship. We're not going to have any more intimacy until you stop doing that behavior. You know, he might be coming home drunk and, and, and then shouting at her and you just pull back. Conversely, you know, it might be something the other way around. And, and you need to find something where you still uphold the relationship, you're still committed to the relationship, you're not leaving the relationship, but you're putting a barrier there and saying, this far and no further. When you're able to do that, and you can show your partner that you respect yourself, and you demand their respect of you too, it will resolve problems in your marriage. Um, I'd like to finish off with, uh, with something which is part of the Christian walk. So if you're not a Christian, you can zone out here. But uh, as Christians, we know we're supposed to make a commitment, we're supposed to get baptized, we're supposed to grow in our walk, we're supposed to have a baptism in the Holy Spirit. But there's something which is not often talked about, and that's a dying to self experience. And um, somebody once said to me, No, he doesn't want to be a Christian because if he follows Jesus, he's going to take him to the cross. And that's true. But God is a gentleman, he will not, he will not, uh, he will not bring you into this process unless you ask him. Uh, this, this dying to self process. But it's, it's a character building process. And what if I said to you that what is the only thing that you can develop in this life that you can take to heaven with you? 
Do not your car, your money, your wealth, even your looks. But one thing you can take is your character. If you believe in the Western God, the Judeo-Christian Islamic God, it's a personal God. And when you die, you keep your personality. And if you have grown your character while on earth, that mature character will be with you in heaven. That's what I believe anyway. And so that's why I believe we should, we should engage with God and say to God, build my character, mature me. I mean, who doesn't want a mature character anyway? But um, I'm going to tell you uh, a story about a friend of mine, John Arnoldson. And he says, when you pray that prayer, Lord, have your way with me, he quivers in his boots. And I'll, 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 t I'll tell you my story as well now. And it's a scary thing because God deals with you. And it's, it's sometimes quite tough. Um, uh, what happened to my friend? His wife went away on a holiday to New Zealand while he was back in South Africa. His wife went out on a yacht. The yacht was supposed to come back the next day and never came back. God woke up my friend in the middle of the night and he said, I want your wife. He said, no, can't have her. God said, I want your wife. No, you can't have her. He fought with God. He struggled with God until at about 3 o'clock in the morning he just he broke down and he said, God, you can have her. And what happened was, at that exact moment, 3 o'clock in the morning, plus the hours, wherever it is, 9 hours ahead of time, that boat had been trapped on a sandbar. And the moment he said to God, you can have her, the, the boat released and the woman, and, and, and the next morning she phoned him. And he was surprised. He thought she had died. Um, I'll tell you my story. You guys all know that I'm crazy about sex. Well, when I was, <laughs> when I was young, uh, God woke me up in the middle of the night. And he said, I want you to remain single for your whole life. Man, that was not what I wanted to hear. You know, I'm a real young, strong South African. I want to get married and God says, I want you to remain single your whole life. I said, no. I, 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 I refused. The next morning I woke up, I opened the Bible, I underlined all the places where it says it's good to be married. <laughs> <laughs> I went to go see my pastor, he said, no, he doesn't think. But as I, as I thought about it, as I meditated on it, I realized what God wanted me to do was trust Him. So it was as clear as day. One evening, I went down to the pier. It was a cold winter's evening in July. I put on my jacket and I walked out in Durban, one of those piers, and I just, I fought with myself. And I said, do you know God? Yes. Do you trust God? Yes. If He wants me to remain single, that's the best thing. Yes. Accept it. No. <laughs> and I thought, and I eventually... I eventually said, yes, God. I submitted to him. I, I, I died to myself. And I said, yes, God. And do you know what happened that night, 13,000 miles away, was the, the night my wife gave her life to Christ. I had no idea. I didn't know she existed then. But it was only years later when she was reading through her, di my, her diary and my diary and she saw the dates that coincided. Once I'd given up my right to have a wife, God was then free to give me one. And I met her a few months later. So once we learn to give up our rights as Christians, God is free to act and move in our life. And He will bless your marriage because you are able to live sacrificially in that marriage. Alright. Thanks guys. Any questions? Yeah. The, 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 a trading for sex. What if the, the man really does not want to go and he would have sex? And then he said, okay, fine. And then he goes and gets sex somewhere else. That's a tough one. All right, well, let me. You, 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 you're an intelligent person. You need to gauge your husband on this one. But you can also work it the other way around. Um, let me give you another example. You've been badgering your husband to take you to the, the playhouse to see a, a play. And he eventually relents and does it. When you get home in the, in the car, you park your car in the garage. Before he goes anywhere, you grab him. And you make love in the, in, in, the, in the car. Boy, the next day he'll be on the, on the phone to the playhouse saying, um, do you have season tickets? <laughs> you know, you can do it in a positive way. Um, it, it does sound manipulative, but it's, it's not as 
uh, a guy doesn't see it that way as much as a woman would see it. And I think, again, you know, be sensitive to it. Any other questions? Okay, guys, you yeah, are, please. When you get married, throw the word divorce out the window. It's not an option for you. You can get through everything. You make commitments in a marriage because there will be hard times when you will want to get divorced.